Good day, everyone. Following my series on the mind of the borderline woman, the psychology of the borderline woman, um, three parts, may I remind you, recently, and another part on the borderline histrionic voices, you can look them up by using the search box in, uh, on my YouTube channel. So these four videos put together generated a storm of questions. And having gone through the questions, I isolated the most frequently asked questions, and they fall into three broad groups. The first group is about splitting. The second group is about uh, self-destructive behaviors. And the third group is about alcohol and substance abuse. So let's take them one by one. Start with splitting. Many people wrote to educate me that I was wrong uh, the borderline woman's behavior has to do with idealization and devaluation, not with splitting. Well, actually, idealization, devaluation is the behavioral manifestation of splitting. Idealization, devaluation is like the car, and splitting is like the engine. <clears throat> splitting is an infantile, primitive defense mechanism. It usually operates in children up to the age of two years and it has to do with a child's inability to integrate the bad aspects of mother for example if she's absent if she's withholding if she's selfish if she's narcissistic and the good aspects of mother if she is nourishing if she is nurturing if she is loving if she is caring a child cannot create a single image of mother an imago a single inner representation of mother, which would incorporate both aspects, the good and the bad. So what the child does, he splits these aspects. There's an all bad mother and an all good mother, or as Melanie Klein illustriously called it, the good breast and the bad breast. Sorry for the pornographic allusion. And so when the child fails to integrate these aspects of mother, what he does, he essentially attributes the bad aspects of mother to himself or to herself and then mother remains all good so there's an all good object which is mother and an all bad object for a while which is the child gradually as the child matures and grows up he begins to integrate these features and he begins to have a more nuanced um, more gray area picture of mother he doesn't anymore divide the world into black and white good and bad, right and wrong, with me or against me, threatening or promising, evil and, and good. He begins to see the world as it is, shades of grey, much more than 50. So this is splitting. Some people get stuck at this stage of personal development. They don't progress. They are unable to integrate. And for the rest of their lives, even as adults, they split. When they come across someone, and especially a significant other, someone they get attached to, someone they bond with, someone they fall in love with or develop emotions towards, when they have such a person in their lives, he takes the place of mother. And so the borderline woman and the narcissistic men, by the way, narcissists and borderlines, they still maintain the primitive infantile defense mechanism of splitting. They are unable to see the other um, as a very complex, multifaceted, multidimensional being or creature. They tend to idealize the other, and then he can do no wrong, he is perfect, he is brilliant, he is all good, he never makes mistakes, inf infallible, etc., etc., or they devalue the other. So idealize or devalue. And when they devalue the other, it's exactly the opposite. It's a dark figure. It's all bad. It's a persecutory object. The person can do no right. No, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, there's anticipation of hurt and pain, uh, which would emanate from this extremely evil figure. And so the borderline woman pendulates, fluctuates, between these two poles, if she has a lover or a spouse or an intimate partner with her own children, 
even with colleagues at work. One day she would idealize, and the next day, or sometimes the next minute, she devalues. The transition between idealization and devaluation sometimes has to do with external factors known as triggers, but sometimes has to do with inner processes, for example, mood lability. So sometimes people around the borderline uh, or the narcissist, they are shocked by the sudden transition. It's very reminiscent of switching between alters, between alternative personalities in dissociative identity disorder, in multiple personality disorder. And this is the reason many scholars actually think that borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder are subspecies, they are variants of multiple personality disorder, of dissociative identity disorder, because the switching between self-states is so abrupt, so unbelievable, and the change in personality and behavior is so marked uh, in some cases, not always, but in some cases, and the change in mood and so on, that it's like another person took over, another personality took over. So idealization and evaluation are actually um, fueled by, by splitting. But while the narcissist idealizes and devalues because of lack of narcissistic supply or abundance of narcissistic supply, so if, if the narcissist has a source of narcissistic supply and this source is a reliable, predictable source and gives the narcissist high quality, high octane narcissistic supply, the narcissist would idealize that source would idealize that person, person who adulates the narcissist, admires the narcissist, applauds, follows the narcissist everywhere, says that the narcissist can do no wrong, he is perfection, he is the best thing since sliced bread. Well, the narcissist would tend to idealize such a person. And then if there's another person and that person is critical, disagrees with the narcissist, or doesn't give the narcissist the narcissistic supply that he seeks, refuses to be coerced or shoehorned, into the role of a supply source, insists to maintain an autonomous and independent existence, has her own priorities, needs, preferences, and so on, maintains independent activities, etc., etc. If she refuses to become an extension of the narcissist, then the narcissist would devalue her. In the case of the borderline, devaluation and idealization do not depend on narcissistic supply, although the borderline does have a false self. In the case of the borderline, idealization and evaluation has to do with hypervigilance. As the narcissist scans all the time for narcissistic injuries, he, when the narcissist sees other people, he scans them. Are they going to insult me? Are they going to humiliate me? Are they, go are they going to criticize me? Are they going to disagree with me? Are they going to slight me? And he anticipates this, and, and this creates anxiety, and to reduce the anxiety, he engages in narcissistic rage. So, narcissist has hypervigilance, but it's, again, directed at narcissistic supply and the maintenance of grandiosity. With the borderline, hypervigilance has to do with abandonment and rejection. So, the borderline scans other people. And the scanning has to do with, are they going to abandon me? Or is he going to abandon me? Is he going to reject me? Doesn't he love me anymore? Doesn't he like me anymore? Is he avoiding my company? So th these, are, these are the scanning operations that take place in the borderline's mind, in her brain. And whenever she anticipates rejection and abandonment, she instantly devalues. And after she devalues, she preemptively abandons and rejects the anticipated source of pain and hurt. Because there's nothing more painful to the borderline woman than being rejected and abandoned. In every which way, by the way, sexually, emotionally, and so on. Well, I hope I clarified this part at least. Now let's talk about self-harm. I was asked if cutting and self-mutilation, physical cutting and self-mutilation are uh, ineluctable, an ineluctable and integral part of borderline personality disorder, whether all borderlines do it. Well, the answer is, of course, no. There are many borderlines who do not self-mutilate, do not self-harm, do not cut, 
And even there are quite a few borderlines who have no suicidal ideation and do not attempt suicide. So this is only one of a few, nine, diagnostic criteria in the DSM edition four. These criterias, criteria were largely preserved in the DSM-5, although the DSM-5 Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, Edition 5, published in 2013, this edition already proposes an alternative, alternate model for borderline personality disorder, which we will not discuss right now. So, not all borderlines cut and mutilate, but I would say that all borderlines are self-destructive. And maybe in this in this way of looking at things, all borderlines do self-harm. There are many ways to self-destruct, and I will mention just three of them. Three of dozens, by the way. Borderlines are very creative and very in inventive in engineering situations and placing themselves in predicaments and conundrums which lead to utter self-annihilation. It's a manifestation of self-hatred, self-punishment, and self-perception as a bad object. The borderline internalized introjects, internalized voices, which had told her when she was a child that she's bad, she's unworthy, she's defective, she's dysfunctional, she deserves love only if she performs. And in this sense, the object relations background of borderlines is pretty, pretty similar to the object relations uh, landscape of narcissists. In other words, they both go the same developmental trajectory through the same path. Uh, only, as Goldstein noted, borderlines are failed narcissists. So borderlines attempt to be narcissists with their children, they fail, and so they become borderline. I dealt with it in another, in another video, and I, of course, advise you to, to see it because it gives me more views and narcissistic supply. Now, uh, I promise to describe three ways uh, in which the borderline um, is, is self-destructive without cutting, without physical mutilation, without anything. So there are many ways to self-harm. For example, one way is self-trashing via sex. So the borderline would tend to choose, frankly, scum. And, I don't know, junkies, ex-con, convicts, uh, you know, serial killers. <laughs> She's, uh, the borderline has a radar for these kind of people. And she would tend to choose scum and then she would engineer a situation where she's, for example, totally drunk, and then she would give him the sex of his life. She would, she would, uh, she would realize all these fantasies, engage in extremely kinky and even sadomasochistic sex, uh, and very often dangerous and unprotected sex. That's that's a way to self harm. It's self trashing. It's a way to humiliate herself. To uh, damage her sense of self-worth to punish herself because she's very angry at herself. When the borderline anticipates rejection or abandonment, not to mention when the borderline is really rejected and abandoned because this does happen, you know. So when this happens to the borderline, she's very angry at herself. She's furious that she had let herself trust, that she led herself to yet another emotional, interpersonal trap of a relationship, because she knows she is a bad, unworthy object. She could have anticipated, she could have predicted that she will be abandoned and rejected, because who would want her? So why put herself in this situation? Why does she keep falling in love with men who reject and abuse and humiliate her? And she's very angry at herself. And one way to punish herself is via this kind of sex, a sexual unprotected adventure with you know, inappropriate partners in very dangerous settings where she fulfills fantasies which are degrading and humiliating and very often painful and physically dangerous. It's an example. Another example is, of course, reckless behavior. The I mentioned unprotected sex, but I don't know, the borderline can suddenly uh, go on a, on a shopping spree and, and burn through her savings, all her savings in one, one evening or she can drive a car in a way which would guarantee, drive under the influence or something, a way that would guarantee an accident. Or she can gamble, enter a casino and you know, leave, uh, leave the casino with, with nothing to her name. And, and the, the numerous reckless behaviors, shopping, gambling, this, that. So this is another way of damaging the self. 
It's, it's another way of self-harming. And then there's, of course, what we call reactance. Reactance is much more typical of psychopaths. But as we said in another video, today we are beginning to reconceive of borderline personality disorder as psychopathy for females. And so uh, borderline women with borderline personality disorder, when they are subjected or exposed to possible rejection and humiliation and abuse and and abandonment, they become, they, they, they develop a kind of psychopathic overlay, they become psychopaths. And one of the things that psychopaths do, they're defiant, they become reactive, they are defiant, they lose impulse control, they can't control their impulses, they become very defiant, very aggressive, and very antisocial, which of course brings upon the borderline the wrath of society, sometimes the wrath of peers, for example, peer judgment, but or, or she gets fired from her job but sometimes she she gets in trouble with the law and the agents of society the enforcement agents of society end up punishing her and that's another example of self-harming that doesn't involve anything physical doesn't involve cutting or burning or you know, any of the other million ways that borderlines self-mutilate and finally there's a the question of of uh, substance abuse and substance abuse is a, is a complex, a very complex issue. Because alcoholism, for example, mimics narcissism. In alcoholism, we have something called alcohol myopia, which, which, which is actually the alcoholic's grandiosity provoked by the alcohol. And for a, after a certain amount of ingestion, after, some, after imbibing a certain level of alcohol, an alcohol blood level climbs to a certain point, the alcoholic person become the, the drunk becomes very grandiose. We all know that, but we all we all witnessed it. And, and not only he becomes grandiose, but he develops very pronounced uh, traits and behaviors which are typical of narcissists, and more precisely, a malignant narcissists, psychopathic narcissists. So it's very difficult to tell where the effects of the substance begin, and the effects of the personality uh, give way. And where it's a mixture, or where it's actually the personality using or leveraging the substance as, a, as an alibi or as an excuse. Um, and so we know that in the case of the borderline woman, uh, when she decompensates, when her defense mechanisms are down, and she is no longer able to separate herself from reality by, for example, reframing reality. So when she gets in direct touch with reality, without the benefit of the firewall, without the benefit of defense mechanisms, which allow her to alter reality so that it becomes palatable. So when she gets in touch with reality without defense mechanisms, she acts out, she decompensates and acts out. Now acting out, very often in the case of the borderline uh, woman, or borderline personality, involves substance abuse. So one of the first steps such a woman would do, she would get drunk, or she would get stoned on weed, or she would consume other, you know, illicit substances. And the reason she does this, because she needs to obtain several effects simultaneously. Remember that the motivation of a borderline woman after she had been rejected or humiliated or abused or abandoned, or after she had anticipated such things, such behavior on the part of her intimate partner. So her main motivation is to escape, to flee the source of frustration and pain. So she splits, she devalues her intimate partner, he becomes a villain, he becomes Darth Vader, he becomes an enemy, he becomes a hate figure, he becomes a persecutory object, she splits. Then she leaves him physically so that he is out of sight, out of mind, object in constancy. But all this is done in order to palliate, in order for her to, to, her, for her to forget her pain. And also in order to punish him. These are two motivations. The main motivation is to avoid is pain aversion, is to avoid the pain. But there's a secondary small motivation of, of hurting, hurting her intimate partner the way he had hurt her kind of retribution or settling of the accounts. And so to do this, she needs to act egregiously. So she figured, for example, she needs to sleep with a stranger or she needs to get so drunk that she causes damage to property 
or she needs to do something to make her intimate partner lose his job. I mean, she needs to do something really bad, seriously bad. She needs to misbehave in a way that is utterly destructive to the relationship, irrevocably. She needs to finish the relationship once and for all, because it had become a source of agony that she can no longer tolerate. Unbearable. So to do all this, uh, she needs to disinhibit. She needs to lose her inhibitions. She needs to reach a point where she no longer cares, no longer cares what, is she, what she's doing. And in the case of sex, for example, if her decision is to have sex with a, with a third party, a stranger she picks up in a bar or something, restaurant so she would also need alcohol's effects on perceptions of attractiveness so beer beer goggles goggles she she would need to drink so much alcohol that an unattractive man would look attractive and today we know that alcohol affects the brain's perception of symmetry in faces and attractiveness of other people so, so it's founded on on neuroscience it's not an imagined effect alcohol alcohol does influence us in a way that we perceive people of the opposite sex, if we are heterosexual, as attractive, as more attractive than, they, than we would find them without her. So she needs this too. She needs this inhibition. She needs to feel that the potential target, let's call him, uh, is attractive. And then she needs to, to become grandiose. She needs to mis-evaluate, evaluate, appraise, appraise inappropriately, risk. She needs to have a risk misperception so that she can allow herself to enter reckless, risky, dangerous even situations without fear. This is alcohol myopia aforementioned. And then she needs to develop uh, fake fake intimacy. Well, fake intimacy could be with a man, with a man. I mean, she picks up a stranger, so it needs to be with a man. So the alcohol helps to create this feeling of growing empathy, support, attentiveness, Caring, affection, comfort, compassion, etc., etc., all of them utterly fake because they are founded on the alcohol's impacts. But still, they are felt this way, they are perceived this way, and even though they are ersatz, even though they are, you know, fake, they are, they, they make do. I mean, they, they work. And so she, she feels growing, um, growing closeness and we know that alcohol uh, changes empathy, has effects on empathy. Alcohol, ironically, makes us more empathic towards strangers than towards people we love. So it fulfills this effect as well. Now, when I say intimacy, when I say empathy, etc., it doesn't have to be uh, with a stranger with whom she's about to have sex. If she goes shopping, she wants to have, she wants to feel good, she wants to feel warm, she wants to feel accepted by the saleswoman or the salesman. If she, I don't know, if she, if she is going to gamble, she goes to gamble in a casino, she wants to feel accepted and wanted and desired and what have you by the casino staff. So by the, by the croupier or by the, so it's, it's a general feeling of warmth, gemütlichkeit, general feeling of acceptance, general feeling of I am a part of the world, the world wants me, the world desired me, I'm finally integrated. Alcohol has this effect. I'm mentioning alcohol, by the way, but weed has some of these effects. Ecstasy has some, uh, MDMA has some of these effects. And I mean, there are quite a few drugs that have some of these effects. Cocaine, of course, increases, enhances grandiosity. And then finally, and perhaps the most important function of such, of this initial phase of misbehavior, which is the phase of substance abuse, it's almost I mean, it happens in like nine out of 10 cases. In nine out of 10 cases, when the borderline feels rejected, abandoned, humiliated, and, and about to be abused by her intimate partner, or when she is actually, she, the first thing uh, she does, she resorts or reverts to some addictive behavior. Now, in the majority of cases, the addictive behavior has to do with a substance. By the way, when I say substance, doesn't have to be an illicit substance. For example, overeating is such a thing <laughs> because food is a substance. So it's an example of substance abuse in a way. So now we come to the last thing. When she consumes alcohol or drugs, she can engage in misattribution. She can attribute her misbehavior and her dissociation 
to the drug. So she would say, yes, I had sex, but I don't remember anything about it because I was drunk. Or I had sex because I was drunk. I didn't mean to, but I was drunk. Or I crashed, I crashed your, your, your expensive car because, you know, I was drunk. So I didn't mean to get drunk. It just happened. There was a lot of company there and it was fun and it was nice and I was in such pain and I was so depressed and I drank, I didn't even count how many, you know, glasses I had. I mean, and so it, at the end I got, I got wasted. So it's like a passive voice. The borderline would, would, would become the passive recipient or the passive um, receptacle of the alcohol. It's the alcohol that did everything. The alcohol is the active agent. She transfers agency. She is no longer self-efficacious. She doesn't act upon the world. The world acts upon her. And this is, of course, as many of you know, an example of an external locus of control. And so she, most, the, many borderline women, when they engage in sex, they go through dissociation. They, at the minimum, they depersonalize. They feel that they are on, on autopilot. They feel that they are observing themselves in some kind of movie where they are, you know, an actress going through the motions of sex. Uh, so they de depersonalize. Also, some of them derealize. They feel that the whole thing is unreal. It's, as I said, like a movie or like a nightmare or uh, it's about to end or they don't know how they found themselves in this situation. And in the most extreme cases, we have dissociative amnesia. Um, they, they cut off. They completely forget the whole sex scenes and the sexual partner, sometimes minutes after the sex. And so they would be in, in great pains or difficulties to explain what had happened, what had actually happened, because they keep saying I had a blackout. And of course, they would attribute it to the alcohol. They would say, the alcohol gave me a blackout. I drank too much. They won't admit that it's part of their pathology, that the dissociation is there to protect them against egodystony, that they feel shame, that they feel guilt, that they know they had misbehaved. And, and they, they don't, how, don't know how to make up for it because they also realize that they had reacted disproportionately. And that in some of the cases, it was all, the trigger was all imaginary, was all in their heads. They were not about to be rejected. They were not being abandoned. They were not being abused. Their intimate partner had to go to a business meeting or had to go on a business trip. This is not something against them. It's his lack of avail availability was not because he didn't want to see them anymore, or didn't like them anymore, didn't love them anymore, but because he had to. And so post facto, after the acting out, after the, the compensation, the borderline goes through a horrible phase where she realizes what she had done. And in many, many cases, she had she loses the partner, the intimate partner, the very intimate partner that she was so uh, terrified to lose. She brings about her own abandonment, the very abandonment and rejection that she was so terrified. And she can't cope with this. And this leads to another cycle of decompensation and acting out. And of course, she immediately finds a substitute. Even the same night, she finds a substitute. And even the casual, the partner of casual sex becomes a substitute. She cathects, she invests emotional energy in, in a new intimate partner, even if it's a short-term intimate partner for a few hours. But she needs to protect that intimate partner in order not to feel the self-inflicted harm and damage that she had lost her previous partner unnecessarily. There was no cause for it. And she had damaged herself beyond measure. And so to compensate for that, she falls in love, so to speak. She she's, becomes emotionally attached and invested and bonded, even if it's someone she sees only for a few hours, even if it's someone who is just a partner for casual sex. She needs this kind of substitution or replacement of the uh, previous primary intimate object. And so generally speaking, we, we know from studies that alcohol serves several psychological functions uh, and purposes quite effectively. Uh, and this is why alcoholism is so intractable. It's difficult to get rid of it. It's difficult to treat. The recidivism rate after one year in, uh, of rehab, that means if someone goes to rehab, spends three months inpatient rehab, and, and then leaves rehab, 
Uh, and even if he has a support network in place, the recidivism rate is enormous. Almost 80% of people who go through rehab relapse within the first year. This alcohol, alcohol works. It, it provides solutions for much needed inner conflicts and dissonances and problems. And uh, I'm sorry, the, the rate is 60%, not 80 And so the first function of, of alcohol is palliative. It helps the alcoholic person to cope with dissonance, frustration, anxiety, anger, stress, sadness, panic, and other negative emotions or mood disorders. And of course, in the case of a borderline, there's only negative emotions and mood disorders. This is her personality. There's nothing else there. She's totally dysregulated, chaotic, and her personality is diffuse and disorganized. Even her identity is diffuse. And then the second function of, of alcohol is restorative. It helps the alcoholic to restore his or her self-confidence and self-esteem also as a man, also as a woman, especially when coupled with a body image issue. So if, if the person has a body image issue, the alcohol helps to solve this. As I mentioned before, alcohol, for example, distorts our perception of symmetry in others. And so we are attracted to them, but we very often interpret our attraction to them as their attraction to us. We kind of project, and of course, borderlines project all the time, everything, onto others. And then there's the issue of disinhibition, as I mentioned. Alcohol is disinhibitory. By lowering inhibitions, alcohol legitimizes narcissistic traits and behaviors like a lack of empathy, extreme selfishness, or a sense of entitlement. The alcohol did it. The alcohol made me like this. I have an alcohol, alcoholic personality, addictive personality, which comes out when I drink. But otherwise, I'm a nice, guy, a nice uh, girl. You know, I'm okay. Alcohol allows the alcoholic to express his or her repressed promiscuity, for example, or aggression, traits that he or she find egodystomic, traits that she or he dislike, uh, dislikes in, in themselves, dislike in themselves, traits that they find denigrating or unacceptable. Alcohol renders the alcoholic much more sociable, much more grandiose, much more sociopathic. The alcoholic becomes volubly defined, for example hates authority figures, feels in control or in charge of others, and um, also in charge of the situation. There is a kind of omnipotence, omnipotence aura, like I'm, leave it to me, I'm in control, everything will be okay, nothing bad will ever happen to me. There's immunity, kind of personal immunity. The uh, alcohol makes people believe that they are capable of anything, anything that they set their minds to. Um, they can become suddenly irresistibly attractive, charming or charismatic and unfettered by rules or social mores. I can do whatever the hell I, whatever the hell I want to. No one will tell me what to do. I'm independent. As a result of all these cognitive and emotional changes, the drunk person engages in reckless behaviors like unprotected sex with a stranger or compulsive shopping, compulsive gambling. And finally, there's an instrumental aspect to alcohol. It allows the alcoholic to accomplish goals. Alcohol, alcoholic becomes psychopathic, becomes goal-oriented. Goals that he would never countenance or consider or try when he is sober. Put all of these together, and this is an irresistible package for someone so distraught and so disharmonic and so uh, disorganized and chaotic, such as the borderline, especially in situations of extreme stress with perceived abandonment and rejection.